It's very loud. Yeah. Go ahead, Michael. Oh, I'm doing this after all. Okay. Uh, sure. Just a short so, overview um, of the work we're doing. Yeah. Right. Um, so yeah, we've actually got quite a lot going on now. We've got a lot of exciting work uh, that we have either just started or that is really making rapid progress. Um, one thing we've been working on for quite a few years is uh, creating ways to bypass the problem of mitochondrial mutations in the uh, cells of long-lived tissues. Um, the classic approach we've been using for a long time now, which is putting backup copies in the nuclear genome, um, that's been making very rapid progress. We now actually have a mouse model where we have uh, those genes, one of them being actually expressed from the nucleus and improving the function of the mitochondria in a mouse that has an inherited mutation in the, the relevant mitochondrial gene. So that is the first time that allotopic expression has actually been done in a living mammal as opposed to in a cell. So that is incredibly exciting progress. Um, the same team is also working on a couple of alternative approaches to addressing the same problem. Uh, so we'll have a lot of optionality going forward for different genes with different mutations. Um, we have a project being done now on tau aggregates inside the cell. Uh, probably most of you know that aberrant forms of the protein tau drive a lot of neurodegenerative aging diseases, including, but not exclusively, Alzheimer's disease. Um, there are a number of antibody therapies that have been or are now in clinical trials. The problem is they only capture aberrant tau outside the cell, uh, which might slow down the progress of tau across the brain, but it doesn't actually do anything to uh, rescue or prevent damage to the neurons in which tau already has a foothold. And so you are at best slowing the progress of the disease going forward, whereas you really want to prevent it. Uh, Dr. DeGray, our founding CSO, uh, identified a really clever strategy, uh, which if I had more time, I would love to describe, uh, to target those aggregates inside the cell. Uh, and we are now working on that right now. Um, we have a project on uh, enhancing people's innate immune surveillance of senescent cells. So uh, most people know about senescent cells and how bad they are. Most people will know about senolytic drugs as a way to destroy those cells. Um, our bodies do actually have an innate ability to destroy senescent cells as they are formed, which is probably a much more physiological way to do that. Um, but they accumulate nonetheless. And so the question is, is that because of inherent limitations in that uh, ability, or is that because that surveillance actually fails over time with aging? And both of those are probably at work. So um, Dr. Sharma and company have projects both to work on rejuvenating the ability endogenously to uh, clear out senescent cells, but also to do a version of CAR-T uh, technology where you are actually souping up uh, cells outside the body and reinfusing them so that they are more effective at clearing out senescent cells. In this case, we'll be using uh, CAR-NK, so the same sort of targeting technology, but using it on natural killer cells instead of T cells. Um, uh, earlier on, for those of you who were at the uh, the EXVO session, Dr. Riba um, described uh, his work on the Sinostem project, where they are uh, doing combination therapy, or a remove and replace strategy, where you are both ablating senescent cells using senolytic drugs, and then uh, enhancing the effects of that with uh, stem cell transplants. We're starting off with a relatively simple and non-replacement type uh, transplant using mesenchymal stem cells, but it's a proof of principle for the idea of combination therapies, which is going to be really important for ultimately curing AD. You can't just tackle one form of aging damage. You have to tackle them all, um, and you have to tackle them all at the same time. 
Um, we have a project led by Dr. Adnasu, who is working on uh, what are called secondary senescent cells. So as you may know, one of the ways that senescent cells uh, cause damage on our bodies is actually by propagating senescence to other previously healthy cells. Um, and he has identified uh, a distinctive way that senescent cells uh, manage to survive in their hostile environment that uh, it turns out that a lot of the conventional senolytic drugs that have been used to target primary senescent cells, so senescent cells that have gone senescent for more intrinsic reasons, um, all of those drugs actually don't work against secondary senescent cells. And so he has not only identified uh, part of the reason why that happens, but also has identified a new senolytic drug candidates that uh, can destroy both secondary senescent and primary senescent cells. So that means, you know, a, a much wider coverage of senescent cell destruction and against, you know, a subset of senescent cells that otherwise be left behind. Um, uh, our spin-out company, Cyclarity, which is working on removing a form of oxidized, uh, sorry, oxidized uh, cholesterol from uh, the macrophages that drive atherosclerosis, uh, is making really good progress. They got a grant that we got jointly with them from the NIH, and so that is uh, moving it forward very nicely. Uh, we have a project uh, at um, Albert Einstein College of Medicine, which uh, you know has a really good aging section with Dr. Jean Hébert, who is working on a, a excellent uh, novel technology to replace neurons in the aging brain. So it's only been relatively recently that scientists have made any kind of progress at all at making neurons other than dopaminergic neurons, uh, like the actual neurons in your um, neocortex where your memory and identity is held, it's only quite recently that scientists have uh, identified ways to make, be able to implant stem cells and cause them to integrate in neural circuitry. That's a, that's a major breakthrough, but the problem is they've been doing that with very small number of cells uh, delivered via injection, which obviously, if, if you imagine like trying to repeatedly over the course of your life uh, deliver cells like by uh, individual injections all across the entire surface and depth of your neocortex in your brain, uh, you are going to do more damage than good, and it is going to be incredibly invasive and dangerous to even try that. So that is like great proof of concept work, but it's not a scalable solution. Um, he has an incredibly inventive new strategy, which if I had more time, I would love to get into, uh, for how we can actually deliver uh, cells across the entire surface of the neocortex, the, the surface and depth of the neocortex, uh, that will then be in situ reprogrammed into neurons and integrate on site. It's an incredibly promising approach to doing this, and I'm very excited that we are funding that work. Um, we have work at the DIFE in Germany uh, by Dr. Tillman Grune, who has been working on uh, intracellular aggregates and lipofusion specifically for decades now. Uh, this is really the first time that people have been working on degrading lipofusion inside cells using actual lipofusion. So uh, one of the dirty little secrets of the lipofusion studies work for the entire time we've been doing lipofusion is that anytime someone really tries to study lipofusion, they haven't actually been using lipofusion because there is so little of it available and it is so difficult to extract from cells. They wind up producing these like lipofusion like substances by doing things like taking a bunch of um, mitochondria and uh, catalyzing them to be damaged using iron or copper. 
and taking the ensuing mess and saying yeah. that's lip effusion. Uh, when maybe it's lip effusion and maybe it's not, right? Uh, he actually has both a source for lip effusion from human and horse hearts, uh, which he has access to in large numbers, and a novel extraction process where we can remove the lip effusion in sufficient quantities to do valid experiments on. Um, and we'll be using the classic lysosens approach of identifying uh, bacteria and other microbes that have novel enzymes that we could use to fortify ourselves to clear this stuff out. So that is a great project that we are funding. Um, we have a project that we really love to finally get going uh, that we've been funding for years now, but it's been difficult to get the mice to work um, as this is a, a somewhat less known corner of aging where um, we have in our genomes inherited uh, the sort of ghosts of uh, old infections in our cells that can be reactivated. These are so-called retrotransposons that uh, are normally suppressed in our cells and inactive, but with aging, the mechanisms that keep them repressed slowly get derepressed, and when they reactivate, uh, they will reinsert themselves in the genome and thereby cause mutations and other kinds of problems, uh, including a lot of inflammation. Um, and so he is developing mice that are similar to the ink attack mice that were first used to launch the senolytic revolution, where uh, they first developed a, a mouse model, whereby via a transgenic model, you could cause senescent cells to destroy themselves when you administered a drug. That was the ink attack model. He's gonna do the same thing for cells when they get activated retrotransposon. He's calling it a retrolytic uh, approach. Um, it, it's been several years, he's been having a hard time getting viable mice with the transgene inserted. Uh, and so there's been no real progress in several years now. Uh, but it's in principle fantastic work. And as soon as he can get the mice to uh, work going forward, uh, I really look forward to seeing that because that's going to open up a whole new field the same way that the ink attack mice did. Um, we also have uh, an ongoing project that we've been doing for several years now to identify uh, the sources and the uh, relative importance of different crosslinks. Uh, we did project years ago on glucosapane, which is the uh, most numerous uh, crosslink in aging human collagen. Uh, but there are doubtless a lot of other crosslinks in other tissues that are very important. And it, it's sort of the whole universe of that is not really understood. And Dr. Clark is really trying to piece out not only which are the most numerous such crosslinks, but which are like functionally the most important and therefore the highest priority for targeting. And that is me signing out. I hope that was at all comprehensible when squeezed down into less than 15 minutes. Happy longevity, AL. Thank you, Michael. Um, I think there is a question for you from Eduard. It had better be quick. Oh, yeah, you're right. You have to go. Oh, perhaps. Okay. okay. Um, Thank you, thank maybe, you, Michael. Yeah. Maybe you, maybe you, if you have to go, go. Yeah, I understand. You said uh, make right. the body replace them with new cells, including yeah. neurons. I mean, building that in, of course, is uh, well. Yeah, I, I think, frankly, that is impossible. But uh, certainly, uh, uh, along the lines of what we talked about earlier, um, with the uh, Cinestem project that Dr. Rabah is doing. Um, you know, doing senolytic therapy and simultaneously or, you know, intermittently doing neuron replacement using the strategy that I was talking about earlier with Dr. Hebert uh, is the way to deal with that problem where you are uh, both eliminating the senescent cells from a tissue and replacing them with new functional cells. Uh, interestingly, in the brain, most of the cells that go senescent are not actually neurons, they are uh, microglia and uh, oligodendrocyte precursor cells. 
So that uh, that's less of a problem than you might think it was. But okay, I am signing off. I hope that was a comprehensible answer. Great, thank you, thank you very much, Michael.